All right, welcome everybody to our seventh lesson of the semester. Um, so last time we talked about uh, drawing different uh, surfaces in three-dimensional space. And it's, it's certainly more challenging to draw surfaces than it is um, functions in uh, X and Y. Um, so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of a break from that and we're going to look at something that will be incredibly useful for us later on called a uh, vector value functions. Pretty much the whole theme of this um, of this first part of the class, lessons one through nine, is essentially kind of laying the groundwork for what we're going to be doing next. This next section will be doing derivatives. The section after that will be integrals. And then after that will more or less be the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we're sort of laying out the groundwork for that stuff. And then we'll get into like the calculus proper once we get there. All right, so today we're gonna to start with something that is technically new, but it really, um, it, it should look very familiar to you guys. And it's called a, a vector valued function. The vector value function is a function of the form r. So we have the r with the little uh, vector symbol right here, um, but we have parentheses t, kind of like we just would with a, with a function. And we don't have parentheses x because x is reserved to be uh, this coordinate right here. So anyways, uh, so we have a vector valued function, which is a vector, but then each of its components can depend on some variable uh, t, which is different from any of the variables or of the components here. We could write it like this, or we could write it in the i, j, k notation uh, like this, f of t times i, g of t times j, and h of t times k. In each one of these functions, f, g, and h, uh, these are all the component functions where I think it's pretty clear f is represented by, or x is represented by f, y is g, and z is gonna be t right here. Although you may also see uh, another common thing to see is x of t, y of t, and z of t. You may see the functions also called uh, those as well. Okay, so one of the first things we learned about way back when we learned about functions was the concept of the domain. So we can't just put anything we want into uh, a function, like most functions will accept numbers like zero or two, but then some functions have issues with things like the negative numbers or, or things like that. Um, so the domain of a vector value function is the intersection of the domains of the individuals, meaning that you uh, you take all of the t values that can go into all of them. They need to go into every single one. So as an example, let's try to find the domain of this vector value function here, which has ln of t for x, 1 minus t for y, and then t the fourth. Okay, so let's do a little review here. What's the domain of X and T? What numbers are okay to plug into that natural log there? Now we do see some uh, different answers here. Uh, one to infinity, zero to infinity. It's gonna be a zero to infinity. You can actually plug like one half into there. Remember ln of one half, for example, is equal to negative ln of two. So it is okay to plug stuff in the smaller than one, so long as it's greater than zero. So we need to have positive numbers in here and that immediately limits the domain of our vector value function to at least, uh, at most actually the positive numbers. Okay, that's all well and good. Now, what about the domain of y of t? What do we get for that? What, what numbers are okay to plug in there? Hmm. Actually, no one's put a correct answer yet. Oh, okay, I, I think we have some correct answers now. Yeah, so it's gonna be a negative infinity to one, but we can include one, right? Because if we put one in here, we have the square root of zero and that's okay. Um, but And then we can have any negative number because it's just going to make the inside bigger. We can't have anything bigger than one, like two, because then we're going to go into imaginary numbers. And while that is legitimate mathematics, we're not talking about that in here. We're just talking about real value functions. Okay. So the intersection between these two is zero to one, including one, but not zero. If we need to remember, we need to be inside both of these here. And then finally, domain of z of t. This one is gonna be all real numbers and we can write that fancy R here. So this doesn't really limit the, the domain at all. So if we combine all these together, if we look for the T that's in all three of these, 
it's going to be this right here. So this is going to be the, the domain, zero to one, not including zero. Okay, so that was a little bit of review. Usually we don't have to worry too much about the domain, but it's just something to be conscious of. Remember, you can't plug in numbers that won't work for the individual functions. Okay, so in calculus two, a plane curve is the set of um, functions like this, uh, where we have parametric equations, and that's in two coordinates. We have x is f of t and y is g of t. So this is a plane curve. Um, so then now, since we're moving up to three dimensions or perhaps even more, um, we're gonna be talking about a space curve, which is the same thing, only we tack on this h of t as well. And this is technically different from a, a vector valued function. Uh, you can imagine a vector value function pointing to all of the points on the, point, on the space curve. So maybe the space curve can look something like this. Then we have our axes here. The vector valued function would point to all of these points and the space curve is the actual object here. So the vector value function points to all of these points on the curve. All righty. So let's see here. So let's take a look at a few of these, these curves right here. Assuming the start of each vector is an origin. Yeah, they're all position vectors. So yeah, they could, they're defined to go from the origin to the curve. So remember, you could always move vectors around without changing them. All right. So describe the curve defined by these three equations right here. Okay, so let's see here. So all of these are linear equations, right? In fact, this is the vector equation of a line right here. So if we plot two points on this line and connect them, then we'll see what the line is. So I'm gonna plug in T equals zero. Let's see what we get for that. We have two, five, and zero. Okay, so we have one, two, one, two, three, four, five, and then we don't go any direction in Z. So there's our first point, and then maybe we could do T equals one to get another point here. So two plus two is four, five minus three is two, and then we have two right here, four, two, two. Okay, so let's go to that. One, two, three, four. We go two in the y direction right here. Oh, why did I put it on the y axis? I have no idea why I put it on the y axis. Uh, it should be right here. Sorry about that. Ignore this point. <laughs> I, was, I was counting out in the, the y direction. Sorry, the first point should be right there uh, with an x value of two. All right, so we have one, two, three, four. We go two in the y direction, and then we go two up in the z direction. So this line is oriented a little bit upwards and going this way. So this is our line. And remember the vector value function, these are all the vectors that are pointing to points on this line. So the vector value function is the set of all these vectors right here pointing to the different places on our line. Okay, so there's that one. That's kind of a simple example to start off here. Let's take a look at this, something a little bit more dynamic here. Uh, sketch the curve defined by x is cosine of t, y is cosine of t, and z is root 2 sine of t. Okay, so oh wait, we have all of these sines and cosines, right? So maybe there's a chance that this satisfies um, some sort of Pythagorean identity. So let's, let's take a look at x squared plus y squared plus z squared and see if we get something out of that. Or maybe maybe it'll be close to something useful here. All right, so if I put x and I square it into here, I have cosine squared. If I do the same thing with y, I also have cosine squared. And then if I square z squared, I square that root 2 and get 2 sine squared. All right, so then I combine these two together here. I have two cosine squared plus two sine squared. And what's that going to equal to? That's right. So we're going to get two from that, meaning that all of these three things added together is going to be two. So we're going to have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to two. Why did I square everything? Because I kind of smelled a Pythagorean identity here. because We have a bunch of cosines and sines. That kind of made me think 
maybe we could square everything and it might be a Pythagorean, uh, the Pythagorean identity might help. Okay, and some people are suggesting uh, that this might be a sphere, and you guys are right. This is going to be a sphere of radius square root of two. Two, two, and two. Root two is like about 1.4 ish. So we could just draw a sphere. Okay, there's the one in the XZ plane. There's the one there. And then we have this one in the XY plane. We have a little sphere of radius root two centered at the origin. So that's the curve right there. All right. So let's see here. And it's, it's going to lie on the sphere right here. All right. And then what we're going to do for the next part here, sketch the curve defined by cosine of t, sine of t. But then this time, we don't have a third trig function here. We simply just have a t. So let me ask you this. If I cover up this and I just look at x and y, then what kind of shape will this be in the xy plane? It's going to be a circle. That's right. So if we have x being cosine, y being sine, we remember back to parametric equations in Calc 2, that was a circle. That was a circle here. So we're going to have a circle in the xy plane. And then what's happening, what's happening with our z coordinate? This is continuously getting bigger as t is getting bigger, right? So we're moving around in a circle, but we're also going upwards. Hence, we're making a spiral like this right here. So we're moving in a circular pattern in the xy direction, but then we're moving just straight upward in um, the z direction. So if we maybe draw first few points here. So at the point t equals zero, then we're going to have one, zero, zero. So we're going to start here. And then once we get to maybe t equals pi over two, where we spin around 90 degrees, then we're going to have zero, one, and pi over two. So when we get there, so we're going to have zero and x, one and y, and then pi over two will be somewhere up here. So we're going to kind of go around in a circle, but then we're also going up. And we're going to keep doing this, and we're going to make the spiral here, or this. And that's what that one's going to look like here. I think some people were still confused why I, how I came up with this. I saw a bunch of cosines and sines together, and I was thinking, okay, well, I know if I have cosine squared plus sine squared, that's going to give me a constant. So I was thinking maybe if I squared all of these, something like that would happen. That's where I got that idea from. All right. Why am I allowed to do that? Um, it's more kind of an idea of it, it. It was just kind of something that I thought of, and then coincidentally, it ended up working here. So because cosine squared plus cosine squared plus two sine squared is two, that means this equation is going to work out because this is x, this is y, this is z. Uh, so is that helix a line or a curved plane? It's it's uh, the helix itself is a curve, so it's like a one-dimensional object. And this vector valued function, this is continuously pointing to the helix here. So it's always pointing to these spots on the helix. All right. So let's move on to the next bit here. Okay, limits. So the limit of a vector value function is defined as, and I bet you can guess what's going to happen with this. Uh, when we have something that's defined with components here, then if we want to do something to the whole thing, we usually just do that thing to the components. So the limit as t goes to a of the vector value function is the limit as t goes to a of f of t, the limit as t goes to a of g of t, and the limit as t goes to a of h of t. So if you ever want to take the limit of a vector value function, all you need to do is just take the limit of each component. And that's going to be it. And, and the limit exists if all three of these exist. If one of them does not exist, then the whole thing doesn't exist. Kind of similar to the way we thought about the domain here. OK. 
And then just like continuity in Calc 1, actually, let's have a little pop quiz here. What, what, what does continuous mean? Or what, what's the equation for continuity back in Calc 1? Do you guys remember specifically what that meant? We know it's where you can kind of draw something like without picking up your, your pencil or whatever, but there's an equation for it too that had to do with limits. That's right, Alejandro has it here. The limit exists and the value exists at that point and the limit is equal to that. So this is where the limit as T goes to A of R of T is equal to just plugging in that specific T value right there. And in terms of the, the components here, it's just that each one of them on their own is continuous in the Calc 1 sense. G of T, then we have the limit H of T, and that's going to be F of A, G of A, H of A. So it's essentially saying, this is kind of like how we did the really easy limits in Calc 1. It's essentially saying that if you want to do the limit at a point where the function is continuous, you just plug in whatever it is. You don't need to do any kind of fancy stuff with it. You just plug in the point. Okay, so that's continuity, and it works exactly the way you'd expect here. Uh, and then, yeah, Tristan, so Tristan has the right idea here. So if you want the whole thing to be continuous, then each component needs to be continuous as well. Okay, so if we have limits and continuity, then naturally we can have derivatives as well. So the derivative of a vector value function, which I want to emphasize is also a vector. So the derivative of a vector value function, see we have the little arrow there, is the limit as h goes to zero of r of t plus h minus r of t over h. And this probably should look familiar to you guys. This is the definition of the derivative back in Calc 1. Only we're just doing it to our vector value function here. All right. And then, so how do we do this in practice? So when we were in Calc 1, we did maybe this definition of derivative for like a class or two, and then we got kind of tired of that. We're like, okay, we want um, to do things easier. How do we do this in practice? We're not going to do this limit every time. And you're right, we're not going to do it every time. If you want to find out what r prime of t is, you simply just do the derivative of each one of these functions here. So we have f prime of t, g prime of t, and h prime of t. And just as, a, as with all of the other concepts here, if even one of these is not differentiable somewhere, then this is not differentiable somewhere either. So remember, it needs to work for all the components to work for the vector value function itself. Okay, and this is nice because since we know how to do derivatives from Calc 1, we can instantly do derivatives of these vector value functions too. Okay. Let's see here. So if we don't have R prime being zero, the derivative vector is tangent to the curve at F of A, G of A, and H of A, meaning that the vector is pointing tangent to however the curve is moving. And it also gives the rate of change in that direction. Now, if you're not necessarily interested in uh, so much the rate of change as much as the direction of change, this is what the unit tangent vector will tell you. So if you simply want to know which direction your curve is moving in, that's what the unit tangent vector will tell you. So we already know that the derivative tells you the rate of change of something, right? So we're going to have that in there. But we want it to be the unit tangent vector. So what do you think I'm going to do to make this be the unit tangent vector? Divide by the magnitude, that's right. So if I divide by the magnitude of our prime of t, then what this is telling me is the direction the curve is moving at t. So if we plug in t into this, it tells us which way is our curve moving. But it doesn't tell us how fast it's moving that way because this has a magnitude of 1. You want to know how fast it's moving that way as well, then you would just look at this without dividing by the magnitude. Okay, so we've, we've set a lot of definitions now, and we haven't done an example in a second, so let's do one of those here. 
All right, find parametric equations for the tangent line to the curve two root t, t squared and ln of t at the point two, one, zero. Okay, well, in order to get a tangent line here, we first need to know the direction that the tangent line is going to go in. So that means we need to know what r prime is. Okay, so let's figure out what r prime of t is. This is a little bit of calc one review here. So in order to get r prime of t as a vector, I just need to take the derivative of each of these three component functions right here. So let's see here. So this is two times root t or t to the one half. If I do the derivative of this, I'm gonna end up with t to the negative one half because I multiply by one half to cancel the two and I lower my power by one to be negative a half. We all know the derivative of t squared, that's gonna be two t. And we all know the derivative of natural log is going to be one over t. Okay, so this is our tangent vector, not our unit tangent vector, but our tangent vector in any generic time here. But we want to know what's happening when we're at this point here. But the thing is, they didn't give us a t value here, right? How do we know what t value we're supposed to plug into this to get the specific uh, r prime? And the way we do that is we know that this point has to equal 2, 1, 0, right? So that means that 2 root t is 2, t squared is 1, and ln of t is 0. And it turns out there's only one t value that makes all of these, these, these three things true. And it looks like you guys are saying it already. It's t equals 1. So we need to plug in the same t value for all of these and then get this point. So this must be at the point t equals one if we're here. So that means that r prime of one, all right, let's see, one to the negative one half is one. We have two times one is two, and then one over one is one. Okay, so this is the direction of our tangent line. And then we need a point that the tangent line goes through, but they already tell us what that is. It's right here. So this is our direction vector or slope. And that makes sense, right? Remember back in Calc 1, the derivative of a function represents the slope of its tangent line. And the same thing applies for vector value functions. If you take the derivative of a vector value function, you plug in a certain point, it'll give you the slope of the tangent line at that point. So that means that our tangent line, I guess I'll call it, um, I'll call it S of T. This is the tangent line. I don't wanna use lowercase T because that's the variable. I don't wanna use uppercase T because we've already used that too. Um, so the tangent line is going to be um, one, two, one T plus the point that we know we go through two, one, zero, like that. There is our tangent line equation right here. What if there's no t value that matches all of the parts? Well, then that means it doesn't actually go through this point at all. So if they say it goes through a point, there must be at least one t value uh, where that happens. I see at least one t value. There may be multiple ones, and there may be multiple tangent lines here. Oh, find parametric equations. Whoops, I didn't read the question. Okay, well, we could, we could do that just as easily. The X parametric equation is T plus two. The Y parametric equation is two T plus one. And the Z parametric equation is T plus zero. So just T right here. All right, so there we go. So there are the parametric equations as well. All right. Oh yeah, why didn't I put parentheses around this? Because it was a point, we want the vector that's pointing to that point, because this is a vector equation. So we want the vector that points right to that point. What does it say here? It says tangent line. There we go. And is the vector pointing to that point from the origin? Or is uh, it just... Yeah, whenever we just specify something with numbers here, that's the vector pointing to that point from the origin. All right. Well, let's move that up a second. A little bit. Okay, let's take a look at another example. 
find a vector function that represents the curve C of intersection of the cylinder X squared plus Y squared equals four and the plane uh, Y minus Z equals two right here. All right, so how are we going to do this here? Well, first of all, we have X squared plus Y squared equals four. So maybe this can help us get our X and Y here. So if we have X squared plus Y squared equals four, what do you think a good X of T will be? And what do you think a good Y of T will be? Yeah, sine and cosine, that's right. So I'm gonna have X of T be two cosine of T, because remember we wanted the square to be four and Y will be two sine of T. So then that way, these guys will satisfy these equations right here. So we square this and we have four cosine squared. And then we have four sine squared, and that equals four, just like we want. So whenever you see a bunch of things squared equaling a number, think about sines and cosines. And whenever you see a bunch of sines and cosines, think about a bunch of things squared added to be a number. Those things are often very closely related. Okay, now we're not quite done here because we also need to make it go through the plane y minus z equals two. Um, but thankfully this isn't too bad since we already know what our y is right here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add Z. Y is 2 plus Z. And then we're going to subtract 2. And then this will end up giving us our Z equation. Since Z is just going to be Y minus whatever 2 is, that means Z of T will just be 2 sine of T, and then minus 2. And there we go. So we have, oh, well, we want a vector function. I wrote parametric this time when we wanted a vector, and then last time I wrote a vector when we wanted parametric. All right, so this time our vector function is going to be 2 cosine of t to sine of t, and then 2 sine of t minus 2. That's what we're going to have right here. All right. Let's see here. There's that example. All right, now for part B, what we're going to do is we're going to find the vector equation for the tangent line to the curve C at the point zero to zero right here. Okay, so remember, we want a tangent line. That means we're going to have to find out what um, the derivative is going to be. So let's figure out what R prime is now that we know what R is. Let's see, the derivative of two cosine is going to be negative 2 sine of t. The derivative of 2 sine of t will be 2 cosine of t. And then the derivative of 2 sine of t minus 2 will also be 2 cosine of t right here. All right. So here's our r prime of t. And we want it at a particular t value. But once again, they don't give us that t value. They give us this point right here. 0 to 0. So for back in our r of t, we want this to equal 0, this to be 2, and this to be 0 right here. So do you guys see a point that uh, where that might be true? What point is going to work for all of those? That's right. It's going to be pi over 2, because cosine of pi over 2 is 0, sine of pi over 2 is 1, and then times the 2. And then sine of pi over 2 is 1 times the 2, but then we subtract the 2. So this means that we're going to have t is pi over 2. All right. Why to plug into r and not r prime? We want to know when the curve itself goes through the point 0 to 0. We want to know when the curve itself goes through there. Kind of like back in Calc 1 when we wanted to know uh, things about the function itself, we plug them into the original, not in the uh, our derivative here. Okay, so now in order to get the slope there, then we do take this pi over two and put it into our derivative. That's where we use the derivative to get the slope of our line. Okay, so let's see. We have negative two sine of pi over two, negative two. We have two cosine of pi over two, which is going to be zero. 
And then we have two cosine of pi over two, which will also be zero. All right, so there's our R prime. All right, and now in order to make our tangent line, we have everything we need. We have the slope of our tangent line, and we have a point that the tangent line goes here. So we're going to have S of T is going to be, and this time they want the vector equation. So this time I'm going to get it right. We have negative two, zero, zero times T plus zero, two, zero, which is the point where it goes to. And there we go. So there is our vector equation right here. Okay, let's see here. We got that one. All right. A curve R of T is considered to be smooth on an interval if the derivative is continuous and the derivative is not equal to zero. So, and we can generalize this definition here to say a curve that is made up of a finite number of smooth pieces glued together is going to be called piecewise smooth. So maybe there's a few points where things kind of go wrong, or there may be some kind of um, bad point here. Um, but as long as there's only a few of them, then you could still at least be uh, piecewise smooth. Why did the point turn into a vector? Because we want to have a vector equation of a line, and we want to begin the line by pointing to this point. That's why this is a vector. Okay, so there's a definition. Um, this, this, we're only going to use this essentially in kind of like technical definitions here, like we need it as like a prerequisite for some other theorem to work. So we're not going to do a lot of things directly with this right here. All right. So if a curve has a cusp at a point, then that means that the derivative is going to be zero right there. However, the converse is not true. It may happen that if we have a zero derivative, then that point could possibly not be a cusp right here. Well, let's take a look at some examples of this. So here is a curve uh, with a cusp. And then we're just going to focus on plain curves to just make this a little bit easier for now. Um, so we have t cubed and t squared. Um, so what we could do is if we look at the derivative here, that's going to be 3t squared and 2t. And this is going to equal 0 when t is equal to 0 right here. Okay, so at this point, so this point right here corresponds to t equals 0. All right, meanwhile, if we look at this other curve, which is only just a little bit different, um, but it's different enough, we see that this is a line, and it doesn't really have uh, a cusp at all. So if we look at the derivative of that, then we're going to have 3t squared and 3t squared, and that's going to end up being the zero vector when t equals zero. Now, in terms of the equations here, it doesn't really look like anything's different at all, right? We take the derivative. And they're both zero at t equals zero. So it doesn't seem like there's any difference between these guys yet. Um, but where the difference happens is when we try to compute dy dx. So remember, dy dx is our, is our traditional calc derivative. And this will be the direction or the slope of our tangent line. Now, does anyone remember how to do this with parametric equations? If we have parametric equations, how do we compute uh, dy dx right here? Anyone remember that? dy dt divided by dx dt. That's right. Let's take a look at dy dt over dx dt here. OK, so if we do that, then we're going to have 2t divided by 3t squared. But then we can simplify that to be t over, or sorry, 2 over 3t. And then when t goes to 0 here, this is going to go to infinity right here, or actually really plus or minus infinity, depending on uh, which way you're coming from there. And that kind of makes sense, right? If we if this is kind of curving in right here, that means our tangent line will be entirely vertical like that. Now let's take a look at it for this one. All right, so we have the same formula for dy dx. It's right here. Here we do 3t squared divided by 3t squared, and we end up getting one for this. We don't really end up getting uh, infinity for this at all. At most, you might say, oh, it's undefined if I plug 
zero into that, but it's not going to go to infinity. So that's kind of the difference here. When we have something going off to infinity for our derivative or our dy dx more specifically, uh, then we're going to have a cusp. But, but if we don't have that going on, like it looks like it's going to some finite number, or maybe there's just going to be a hole there, then um, we're going to not have a cusp. All right, and the zero, yes. Yeah, so what does r prime equals zero as a vector mean? It, so r prime is the rate of change of our vector, right? Remember, we have this vector that's pointing to our curve at all times. So pointing here, and then pointing here, and then pointing here. When r prime is zero, the curve is more or less kind of taking a break, or the vectors are taking a break from moving. So at that instant in time, our vectors aren't changing at all. They're pointing in the same direction for that time. And then when r prime is no longer zero, then our vectors begin moving again right here. How is this infinity? Well, I'm plugging zero into my denominator, right? So as I'm getting really close to zero, my denominator is getting um, really small. And dividing by a small number, we'll send it off to infinity. All right, so there we go. So those are cusps. So let's take a look at a, an example right here. All right. So the curve traced out by a point P on the rim of a circle as the circle rolls along a straight line is called a cycloid. I don't know if you guys have, have heard of this before. Um, effectively, what you could do is you could put like a colored piece of tape on one part of your bicycle wheel. And if you track the motion of where that colored piece of tape goes, it's going to end up looking like this. It's going to go down and it's going to hit the ground and then it's going to immediately bounce back up here. All right, and so they give us equations for what this is going to be. So if the bicycle wheel has um, a radius A, then this is going to give the position of our little piece of tape on the wheel at any given time right here. Okay, and then one arch of this happens over a period of two pi right here. Let's see here. Sorry, I need to get some water. Okay, so for this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to show that there's going to be a cusp for the cycloid at every time t is a multiple of 2 pi. So we're effectively going to show that all these cusps here, these are going to happen at multiples of 2 pi. And we're going to do that um, kind of in the same way that um, we did the uh, number one from the previous page. So we saw that we have a cusp when our dy dx or our slope of our tangent line goes to plus or minus infinity. So we're gonna see that every time we have a multiple of two pi here, we're gonna have the same thing happen. All right, well, let's see here. So in order for, this to, for us to do this, we need to know what the derivative of our vector value function is. Let's go ahead and do it. All right, so now in this problem, A is going to be a constant right here. Oh, what did, what did I write up there? I wrote that we're trying to show that all of these cusps happen at multiples of two pi. Sorry, I went through that pretty fast. All right, so let's figure out what the derivative of this cycloid is going to be. Right, so the derivative, if I have a constant here, the constant will just stick around. And then the derivative of t minus sine of t will be one minus cosine of t. That's the derivative of my x right here. And then the derivative of y, well, a, once again, is a constant, so the derivative ignores it. And then the derivative of this constant on its own is zero. And the derivative of negative cosine is going to be positive sine. All right. So there we go. So there's our derivative. And this means that we have dy dt and dx dt. All right. So then let's take a look at dy dx. And we want to see where this is going to end up being positive infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so dy dx is dy dt over dx dt. We saw this fact back in Calc 2. All right, and then dy dt 
is a sine of t. And then dx dt is a times one minus cosine of t. All right, so the first thing that we can do here is we can end up just canceling out the a's. And this kind of makes sense, right? Like these cusps would be here uh, no matter how big the radius is. If the radius was just smaller, then it would still take two pi to get to each of these cusps. So the, the radius isn't going to matter for this in any way. Now, remember the way, the way we had infinity before is we had our denominator equal to zero when our numerator was not zero. So let's check this out. Let's see when one minus cosine of t will be zero. Well, that's the same thing as cosine of t being equal to one. And let me ask you guys this, what t values uh, is that going to happen with here? That's right. So we're gonna have multiples of two pi. But once again, we see that our denominator is going to be zero at those times. But the thing is, is that we're not quite done here. What's wrong with just stopping right here? Like what about what, what's going on, especially with our numerator? Yeah, the sign also goes to zero, right? So if we plug in t is two pi n, then we effectively have a zero over zero situation going on right here. Why did I set it equal to zero? Remember back in this older example, we had a cusp when our denominator went to zero because we had plus or minus infinity for our derivative. So I'm trying to recreate the same thing only with this cycloid function. Here's my denominator and I set it equal to zero. All right, and I think you guys have guessed it here. I'm seeing a lot of it in the chat here. We're gonna use L'Hopital's rule to see which one of these will win out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the limit as t goes to um, 2n pi. And I'm going to do sine of t divided by one minus cosine of t. All right, so this is a zero over zero case, so we can indeed use L'Hopital's rule. So this is the limit as t goes to 2n pi. We have cosine of t divided by negative sine of t. Right here. Oh, oops, sorry, positive sine of t. I'm used to doing integrals now. Uh, um, that's right, yeah, I was worried about my signs for a second. All right, so now let's go ahead and plug in 2n pi into this. So if I plug in 2n pi into here, I get zero for my bottom and I get one for my top. So it really is gonna end up going to plus or minus infinity. If you have something finite up here, but then something going to zero on the bottom, you're gonna head to plus or minus infinity. So at first we got a little bit scared. At first it might seem not like a cusp, but it did end up being that way. So the multiples of two pi are going to be our cusps for this bicycle curve or the, the cycloid curve. How are we doing on time here? Um, oh, we got eight minutes. Uh, the, the thing says it's 14 pages long, but uh, the last four of those are now u triads. So we're actually not too far away from being finished. Um, why plus or minus? Because if you come from the left, say, this is going to be a tiny negative number. And if you come from the right, it's going to be a tiny positive number. Okay. I feel like I'm missing out on a lot of pets in this chat. I don't have like my, my participants thing open. <laughs> All right. Uh, let u and v be differentiable vector valued functions and f of t be a differentiable real valued function. So effectively what this is going to be is this is going to be a scalar. So if we have this f of t kind of on its own, then it's almost kind of like a scalar back when we were just learning about vectors. So then we have all of these different rules for um, derivatives here. And these, I'm gonna go through these really quickly because all of these are either really obvious, like yeah, of course that's how it works, or there's something that kind of comes from calc one right here. But let's say we have a constant function, meaning that this vector is pointing the same way, no matter what t is. Well, if you do the derivative of that, you're gonna get zero. I don't think I need to explain that one too much further. Um, if we do the derivative of two vector value functions added together, it was just doing them separately, just like the way derivatives work back in Calc 1. Uh, if we have the derivative of a constant scalar times a vector value function, you could simply just ignore the constant 
take the derivative of the function. That's how functions work back in Calc 1. All right, this one's a little bit interesting. So we have a scalar function and a vector function multiplied together. Remember, we can always multiply uh, scalar sense vectors. If we want to do the derivative of these multiplied together, then we effectively just do a product rule. So we do the derivative of the scalar, leave the vector one alone, and then we leave the scalar one alone, do the derivative of the vector. All right, if we have the dot product of two vector value functions, the product rule also applies with those. And if we have the cross product, no surprise, the product rule applies for that. Although notice that um, for this one right here, um, remember that these, you can't just switch these around. So I can't just put V first and then U prime and then U V prime. It has to go in the same order that your original one started here. Uh, so watch out for ordering whenever you're doing a cross product. Notice that the ordering is consistent with each of these. And then finally, if we have a scalar valued function plugged into a vector valued function, then we effectively have a version of the chain rule happening right here. Okay, so I don't, I don't think any of these are particularly surprising. I think if I even didn't show you this sheet, you, this would be what you would expect uh, for these to, the way that these will work. All right, and then finally, we're gonna finish things off with integrals. An antiderivative of a vector valued function is the function capital R, capital F, G, and H, such that the derivative of our capital R is going to be our lowercase r. Remember, this is the this is what the antiderivative means right here. What if you have a vector function in a vector function? That doesn't necessarily make sense because remember the input for our vector functions are always scalars. So you can only put scalars into vector value functions, at least for now. There is math that studies vectors into vectors, but we're not going to be doing that here. But yeah, we're only putting scalars into vector value functions. For now, for, for the rest of the semester, don't, don't worry about that. Okay, the indefinite integral is defined to be the indefinite integral of each one of the components. Once again, I don't think this is too big of a surprise. Okay, and then, um, oh yeah, and then we have to have our um, plus C can't forget about our plus C when we do an integral here. Um, but the, notice that this C is actually a vector. This is a vector. This is a vector. So naturally, the, the constant has to be a vector as well. And the way we will usually write this is C1, C2, and C3 right here. What's the difference between capital and lowercase r? Capital R is the antiderivative lowercase r, meaning if we take the derivative of capital R, we get lowercase r. All right, and then the definite integral will work exactly the way you'd expect to. Um, so this is going to be um, capital F of B minus capital F of A. It's going to be um, capital G of B minus capital G of A and capital H of B minus capital H of A. This is essentially the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So we do the antiderivatives of each one of these functions right here, and then we just plug in B, and then we subtract when we plug in A. And we just do that with each one of the components here. Okay, now if any of this stuff does seem unfamiliar, I've kind of breezed past it because you know we've been using all of this stuff in the previous classes, but if any of this does seem unfamiliar, um, feel free to, to go back and review this. Actually, I encourage you to go back and review it if, if some of this seems a little bit shaky. Uh, in particular, now you try a problems have been kind of uh, tailored for review. All right, so we have one final problem here and it's to do this integral right here. So we're gonna do the antiderivative of this vector value function. That means that we just need to do these three separate integrals right here. I know we're running out of time, so I'm just gonna do this real fast. If we do the first one, Remember the way we do even powers of sines is by using the half angle identity and then we do the antiderivative. And I'm gonna put plus C1 because remember our constant is going to be a vector here now. 
All right, we have tangent of t. Remember, that's going to be sine of t over cosine of t. And if we do u is cosine of t, then we're going to end up getting negative natural log of absolute value, cosine of t. And then we have a C2 for that. All right, and then our final one, which is a little bit of a Calc 2 review, um, we have t e to the t. I'm going to do tabular for that one. So I have t10, e to the t, e to the t, e to the t. We connect these guys. And so we have t e to the t minus e to the t plus c3. So if I were to kind of just finish this off and put this into a vector, our answer is going to be uh, one half t minus sine of 2t over 2, um, negative natural log of absolute value of cosine of t, and t e to the t minus e to the t plus a constant vector, but this is going to be uh, just a capital C, and its components are C1, C2, and C2. I just kind of went through that uh, real fast right here. We'll be needing to do calc integrals and calc two integrals in this class. Um, we're not going to go insane with those, but but yeah, you, you should definitely be able to do like these calc two integrals. I, I, I do expect that of you guys, um, but we're not going to do some like insane long like trig sub kind of thing. Like we we already. We already did that to you guys in Calc 2, so we're not going to do it here. But we do expect you to do kind of like lower level Calc 2 integrals. Um, professor, I've got a question. Um, all right, well, just a second. Let me cut off the, the recording here.